So, it's amazing to hear your whole life described in three sentences, that's, yeah. Um, so I've had a varied, very varied career, and I find myself in a slightly dangerous place here, bridging between Graham and Joel, who probably know more about soil between them than anyone else in this room, I guess. I don't want to offend anybody who might know more, but uh, I, I'm not an expert on soil, um, so please bear that in mind in what I say. Uh, yeah, I feel slightly daunted by these two giants who I'm going to try and build a bridge between in the next uh, 20 minutes. Um, however, I'll do my best. Mostly what I'm going to talk about is the work that the Permaculture Association has been doing around soil uh, over the last, or the research section of the Permaculture Association has been doing around soil over the last three years. Um, So, in late 2012, the association research team began to focus on soil. And we got some funding from good old Slush. That's Lush Cosmetics. We've already got a credit yesterday for the, they currently fund my job. So, they get a big credit for all this amazing work they fund. Everyone go and buy some soap, please. Um, and this ran until Christmas 2014. And as the output of that funding, we published the Permaculture Soil Test Handbook and the Permaculture Soil Advice Booklet which are online, they're not physically published. You can get them from our website, which if you go to the Permaculture Association website and click on the research uh, thing on the top bar, you will find this under Soil and Biodiversity Project, and it's free for you all to use if you so wish, wherever you are in the world. Although I did have a lovely email from somebody about two weeks ago who's working in Southern Africa saying that really we need to put some more work into developing the tests to fit for the Global South, and I think that's right. So those of you who are in the Global South would like to share in that work, please do. I guess our tests, although in attempting to be universal, are primarily probably aimed at temperate uh, areas, because that's where we've tested them in the, in the UK. So why did we start with soil? I started on this within three months of coming into the post. Why did we think soil was the right place to start uh, in permaculture research? Because everybody says, as we've heard again this morning, permaculture is good for the soil and using permaculture techniques will improve soil health. Okay, great. We're all up for this. We think permaculture is really good for soil. But how do we know that that's true? And how can we improve our own soil using permaculture? How do we know what we're doing works? So the first thing that I started to ask when I came into post was, what are the big claims that permaculture makes? A, and B, how do we know that any of these things are actually true? And so to me, soil and then subsequently biodiversity seem the obvious place to start, because I think I can say, hopefully without fear of contradiction, that everybody working on permaculture thinks soil and biodiversity are really important and that we're doing good things for soil and biodiversity. But do we really know whether we are or not? Do you know in your own garden that what you're doing really benefits uh, the soil? So uh, let's get our hands dirty. That's the place to start understanding soil is to go out and play with some. Our own soil, preferably. I would encourage you all to go home, return to your gardens and start playing with the soil. Um, so we established some criteria for the tests that we wanted to develop to help people find out whether what they were doing was good for their own soil. And these were our kind of key criteria. Our tests must understand soil as a holistic system, not as a load of disconnected bits. Um, the test would need no specialist equipment. The test would require no specialist knowledge. I suppose you could say permaculture is specialist knowledge, but no specialist in-depth scientific knowledge. The test should take no more than two hours. They should give genuinely useful information about the soil, and they should enable actions to improve the soil further. Well, I don't think this should be too difficult. This looks quite straightforward to me. Surely it's possible to create tools that enable us all to understand our own soil without having to use, have a lab in our back garden or do a degree or a module in soil science. But actually, it turned out to be rather more difficult than we thought. And we did find some really good international... We started with looking for international examples, and we did find some really good international examples which we incorporated into our tests. So it wasn't totally barren, but we really struggled with the fact that soil science in general 
This may be becoming less the case, but for most of the last 50 years has been very dominated by lab-based, uh, lab testing. Uh, there's been a real focus on chemistry and very little on biology. And, and um, I had some, a real leap forward when I met Professor Jeff Squire from James Hutton. I know there are some guys from James Hutton Institute here. Um, I met Jeff Squire at a conference and we were talking about soil. And he, he said, well, really, three, soil has three legs, chemistry, biology, and structure. And really, soil science for most of the last 50 years has thought about one of those legs and a little bit about structure and really very little about biology. Now, I can say that in the last five years, that started to radically change. But soil, uh, soil science and soil, our understanding of soil has been domina uh, um, dominated, as, as Graham touched on, uh, and Jeff as well this morning, by uh, chemistry at the expense of structure and uh, biology. So we adopted what we call a biostructural approach. And there, um, uh, Jeff Squire's words, he talked about a biostructural crisis, an international bi uh, biostructural crisis of soil, which underpins the problems that Jeff talked about, uh, and uh, also Graham uh, with the desertification of soils, this, um, this, this kind of crisis, this biostructural crisis. Uh, so soil science tends to look at the smallest parts, not the whole. It's characterized by a strong emphasis on NPK and to some extent micronutrients in soil, as Graham described very well. Uh, and we discovered to our surprise there were no even nationally agreed tests, although uh, bulk density and pH are the kind of two tests that everybody seems to think are the ones that are really established, and we have included them in our tests, but we felt that was too small. Just having two tests we felt was way too small, um, way too limited. So this quote, which I found, just sums it up, really. This is apparently what soil testing is. Soil testing is a special chemical analysis that provides a guideline for lime and fertilizer needs of soils when considered in conjunction with post-fertilizer management and cropping history. So now you will know, so I give up. There's no point in me trying to do tests because this is what it is. It has to go off to a lab and a chemist has to look at it. Um, I don't want to be too harsh on chemical testing. It is really useful to get your soil chemically analyzed. But the idea that this is the whole of what soil testing is, I find a little problematic. So here's my attempt. Um, I should acknowledge Tom Kemeny, who is the intern on this project, who did fantastic work. These words are as much his as mine. The purpose of these tests is to measure the quality of your soil. The tests focus on healthy soil that is rich in microbial life and has a good structure. So that's my pitch at what a permaculture approach to soil might be. That quote, I've tried to capture what I think. Uh, if we're going to test our soil from a permaculture perspective, this is what we're looking for. So, the developing my permacultural approach to soil. Three characteristics, I've already touched on them. Rich biological life, good structure, and available nutrients. That's the chemistry bit. Our soil tests focus really on the biological life and the structure, the biostructural approach, uh, which I've already mentioned. Our basic belief is that a well-fed soil with beautifully cared for biological life and a good structure will generally feed plants very well, I'm not saying you shouldn't get your soil chemically tested, but on the whole, if you look after your soil, it will look after your plants. Feed the soil, not the plant, is a well-established principle of organic gardening. It's not entirely true. If you're growing carrots, for example, you would probably feed them rather differently than potatoes, but the basic principle is right. And I want to add to that that I think designing good soil, what did Jeff say this morning? Ethical design science is definition of permaculture. So we need to ethically design our soil. Um, a design for good soil should be a key part of all permaculture growing projects. The answer lies in the soil. Good soil has a rich biological life, ranging from billions of bacteria and tiny fungi to worms and beetles. Graham has already introduced that beautifully. And it's this biological life which creates the soil. It's not the chemistry that creates the soil, it's the biological life that creates the soil. But much conventional farming practice ignores it, which maybe you can get away with, but much conventional practice is actually openly destructive of uh, soil biology. And I was in a farmer's field on Sunday afternoon. I was just walking past it. I'll just have a look, ready for this talk. So I just dug my heel. It was a ploughed field. I just dug my heel into the soil. Could I find a worm in there? No, I couldn't. So I went a bit deeper. Could I find a worm in there? It was basically sand, essentially. You know, the structure, there wasn't really much structure. It was pretty just like raw sand. And there was no biological life that I could see. There were certainly no worms in there. Um, and just by looking at it, you could see that the... The life in this soil was pretty thin on the ground. Uh, however, a revolution in soil science has recently begun, 
um, as we're beginning to understand just how important fungi, worms, and bacteria uh, are. Is that a no. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, all right. Um, so I just like this quote. It's quite a long one, so forgive me, but I hope you can uh, deal with this. I just found this um, in a, 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 an article that was on the internet. I just thought it was a really nice quote, so I, I bear with me if you don't mind me reading it. Recent research has revealed the true nature of soil organic matter. This is 2013. The prevailing thought was that most soil organic matter was comprised of decomposed plant material. In other words, it was made of dead stuff that was rotting. But we now see that clearly it is actually bacterial and fungal remains that makes, make, most, uh, make up most of this. So actually it's really alive. The implications are that building soil organic uh, matter and sequestering carbon are absolutely dependent on the living part of the soil. Essentially, biology is everything when it comes to regenerating, sustaining healthy soil. Soil is indeed living. Well, some people in the organic movement and permaculturists have been saying this for about 70 years, but science is finally really establishing clearly that soil is alive, it's a living thing, and it's through supporting and building that life that we can produce and support healthy soil. Um, now, I would... I didn't know quite how to pitch this, whether to pitch it in a really scientific way or in quite a basic way. Um, I could have gone into much more in the kind of revolution that's taking place in the literature that's being produced on soil. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to refer to two articles which I found really exciting and enlightening that have come out at the start of this year. Um, Earthworm Services for Cropping Systems, a review. Anyone who doesn't know Agronomy for Sustainable Development, I mean, it is the most amazing journal. Um, even if you don't have access to it, you can get access to the abstracts online. I guarantee there won't be an issue goes by which you don't find something exciting and informative uh, in there. Uh, it's run by INRA in France, which is like the French um, Agricultural Institute. They've got a really strong organic and, and um, bio, uh, you know, um, ecological agriculture program. So have a look at uh, agronomy for sustainable development. Um, give yourself a few hours because if you're like me, you get on the internet and you find one link and it takes you somewhere else and then it takes you somewhere else. You know, uh, agronomy for sustainable development. Once you start, you can look at all the back issues, all the abstracts are there. You can go back 10 years and find all this amazing stuff, uh, uh, really good science about what we're already doing in permaculture and some new things that we can do in permaculture. So, this wonderful article Earthworm Services for Cropping Systems, i.e., what do earthworms do for our soil? Big review article. Um, worms improve soil structural stability. Worms modify soil organic matter and nutrient cycling in an extraordinary way. And what was most amazing to me and is a really new discovery, worms induce the production of hormone-like substances for plant growth and health. So not only are worms making soil, they're also looking after your plants. Their physical existence in your soil is like medicine for the plants that you're growing in that soil. Well, Graham's already said how amazing worms are in terms of their physical action on the soil, but they're also pretty amazing uh, in their, the way they support what you're growing in non-physical or, or non-mechanical uh, ways, in ways beyond the mechanical. Um, direct drilling of soil can increase worm abundance. Uh, organic amendments help worm abundance, and worms are vulnerable to pesticides. Well, I guess we kind of knew all this already in permaculture, except perhaps the one about the hormones. But here it is, absolutely no question, a review of all the things that science we know about earthworms. Here is what we've said all the time in permaculture for years about worms. Absolutely, unquestionably true up there for you. Why we should love our worms, right there. One other article. This is based on they claim it's the most in-depth study of a single site looking at the effects of uh, conservation agriculture and organic farming that's ever been done. I don't know if that's true or not. I guess people who've been, well, Graham might claim that he's got an older one, but this is a, a, you know, a university-supported scientific test site. Um, so what did they discover? After 14 years of a comparative system between conventional conservation agriculture and organic farming, what did they find? Um, they looked at the long-term effects of conservation, organic, and conventional farming on soil biota and compared them, and the effects are pretty extraordinary. Conservation and organic farming hugely boosts soil life. Macrofauna can increase from 100% to 2,500% more in these systems than in a conventional system. Nematodes increase from double to seven times uh, as many, and microorganisms has a, a, a substantial effect on uh, as well. I mean, these are massive, 
massive differences between a conventional soil and they found that conservation management is the most effective system, actually. So what does that look like? In the long term, no tillage systems and using cover crops, both of which are things we've already had mentioned by Graham, are the best things for soil biota. Better even than using legume manures, much better than pesticides and mineral fertilizers. So I may be preaching to the converted here, but there it is in absolute black and white. What we're doing is exactly, in, in permaculture, is exactly what we should be doing if we want to have healthy living soil. Soil biology is immensely complicated. I think Graham Norton said this morning it's the most complicated uh, living system that we know about. Joel will hopefully shed some light on that um, and give us some more understanding of that soon. I don't claim to understand that at all. Uh, it's immensely complex. But we don't need to understand it. Because once you get out and start looking at soil, you very quickly discover that just by looking at soil, smelling soil, feeling soil, living soil looks very, very different to dead soil. You don't need a lab or a microscope to tell you that. You very quickly will see, um, uh, you begin to understand just by looking at soil um, how rich and alive it is. So we use two very simple tests, proxy measures of the entire soil biology. Earthworm count. How many earthworms have you got? They reflect a massive amount of invisible life in the soil. And the second one is the slaking and dispersal test. You roll a, bowl of so a, a little ball of soil, you put it in water, you leave it for 24 hours, well, you look at it after an hour, just, just in a, a glass beaker, how much of it has fallen apart? You look at it after six hours, how much has fallen apart? You can come back after 24 hours, how much of it's fallen apart? The more organic life there is in the soil, the longer that ball will hold together in the water. So if I took the farmer's soil I looked at on Sunday, I'd have to spit on it because it was so dry, roll it into a bowl, stick it in my glass, within a few minutes it would just all fall apart because there's no organic life holding it together. If I took Graham's soil, did the same thing, well, we have to test it one day, Graham. It would last for a long, long time before that soil eventually falls into the water. The ball would stay uh, solid. So that's slaking and dispersal test. Uh, it shows you how well tied together the soil is by the hummus that's in it. Our little friends again, Graham and I share, we should form a, a fan club, the Earthworm, Earthworm Fan Club, northeast of England, so, stroke southeast of Scotland, Earthworm Fan Club, we shall establish. Tireless worker for humanity. We also looked at structure in our tests. Healthy soil needs to have a good pore structure, hold air and water, and allowing roots and soil fauna to pass, soil life to wriggle through. It also needs a good crumb structure, which I've already talked about, balls of soil that hold together, um, but not, not too hard. They can be crumbled apart. That's what good soil looks like, if we could look down the microscope. Nice big pores, lots of gaps between them. So the tests that we use are infiltration, how quickly does water pass into the soil? If it goes too quickly or too slowly, that's not great. You want soil that drains moderately slowly. That's good crumb structure. Soil texture, feeling it. Uh, bulk density, which is a little bit complicated. You can read that in the soil test. Visual inspection, slaking and dispersal I've already mentioned. These are all tests that you can do in your home with basic equipment to give you some idea of the structure of your soil. We also do soil pH test because that's pretty critical for what you can grow. Different things will grow in different pH. I guess you know that already. Soil depth. Obviously, we're trying to build deeper and deeper soils. Um, if you're up in the North Pennines or mountains of Colorado, as uh, we were hearing about yesterday, um, you've probably got pretty thin soil. You might have a foot of soil, and then you're down onto the bedrock. But wherever you are, over time, repeating these tests, you should be finding your soil is gradually getting deeper and deeper. As you feed it, look after it, the soil should be piling up on top of your bedrock. Um, if you're me, you've got about two and a half foot of good soil down onto the, the, the sub clay, the under clay. Um, I've, added, I've added at least six inches on top of that in the last 10 years in my garden. Uh, we look at waterlogging and dryness, we look at anaerobic conditions, we won't talk about that now. I guess I'm running out of time. Um, so yes, go for your soil chemistry test, that's fine. Not against that, but, because uh, you do need to find nutrient shortages or pollutants that might be there. However, central to a permaculture approach to soil is a holistic approach to soil. That means that detailed soil chemistry or nutrient al analysis should only be one part of an integrated, rounded approach to soil health, to soil feeling, feeding, to understanding soil biology and understanding uh, soil structure. Um, alongside the test handbook, we've produced the Permaculture Soil Advice booklet. 
I guess that anyone who's an experienced permaculturist will already be doing all the things that are in there, but it may still be worth uh, a look. We suggest that if you want to see the development of your soil over time, you can repeat the tests uh, yearly, which should hopefully show that what you're doing is actually working, particularly who is the lady on the, who's got the nettles? Whoever, the lady over there growing nettles, hopefully if you start to work on your soil, you'll see it starting to change and deepen and the life build up. Although if you've got lots of nettles, it might be, uh, it might be good already. Um, time invested understanding your soil and all that lives in it is always time well spent. I'm a great enthusiast for people just getting out and handling their soil. And we hope that eventually, we haven't set this up yet, we hope we can create a database of our results to show the benefits that we're achieving. So there he is, our little friend, the soil, waiting to give you a hug. Get out there and play with him. Go home, get your hands dirty, spend some quality time getting to know your soil. It will be well, well worth it. Thank you very much. And I found in the broken down shed at the back a bottle of glyphosate. And I'm really concerned now. The soil has got some small little like kind of, um, uh, I don't know, the little brown things with sort of scales on their back and they're wandering around, but no worms and the glyphosate. You know, am I screwed? Can I do anything about that glyphosate? The yes, I'm glad you mentioned glyphosate. The third bit of research I should have mentioned was some research done at Coventry, and the reason I didn't, I couldn't find the, I read it and I couldn't find the reference in my notes, which is a classic research mistake, um, was uh, some research came out of Coventry University last year that showed without any question at all that Roundup, uh, is Roundup glyphosate? I don't know, I don't know about all that stuff, yes. Uh, Roundup definitely has a major harmful effect on all soil biological life. So we know for certain now, absolutely proven beyond any doubt, that whoever's been putting that on your soil, it will have had an effect, not just on the things you can see, but on the stuff that you can't see. But, I mean, I, I garden my own soil, but we've taken a very, very careful approach in the test to not say you should dig, or you shouldn't dig, or you should have raised beds or not raised beds, you should do this system or that system. We, I'm not about preaching about that. So um, there's lots of things that I would do in my own garden. I mean, getting some organic matter in there is the key uh, thing you need to do, working it over. I was in a similar situation when I took my garden on. So I can say personally what I've done. I mean, we had a garden that hadn't been cultivated for 40 years. It was just mown as grass. It's pretty dead soil. Just keep, dig it, double dig it, dig it if you can, is what I would say. Um, and then don't dig it anymore after that. Um, and stick loads of organic matter and keep going back to the organic matter. Keep putting keep putting it. It's always, it, it, the answer is always to feed, to feed the soil. There's loads of good advice you can get and I, I wouldn't want to put myself here as someone who's going to advise you of all those things. If you read our soil advice handbook, it will basically tell you to do those things. Improve the structure, improve the biology, the worms will come. Will that get rid of the poison? I'm worried about the poison. Yeah, it will, over time. It decays slowly, but um, yeah. yeah. Graham, do you want to, sorry. For you? Me. Um, maybe this isn't for you and Jeff Lawton and others keep um, talking about it, but the SOC, the soil organic carbon, that's a lot of carbon that's now in the soil that's not in the atmosphere. Is there going to be a, a, a talk or more emphasis on how much you know, good environmental work we're doing by building soil in a climate and carbon sense. Okay, the, yes, great question. The answer is very simple. The research is absolutely conclusive. There's no, I mean, that's been much better publicized than the research. Building soil stores carbon. It, by building carbon, so, so the, the question really is, how far are we interested in how much carbon we're storing? To me, I'm not very interested in that. I know that by building soil, we're having a substantial effect on uh, sequestering uh, carbon. So my immediate answer would be to say, go and, read, go and read that research. And then if somebody wants to do some research on, in permaculture, how much carbon we think we're storing, that would be a fantastic research project. For me, it, it goes back to some of the things that were said this morning um, by Cathy Debenham. For me, it's enough to know, what am I getting out of this? 
one of the things I'm getting out of it by building soil is that it's good for, uh, for carbon. Um, other people, and I, I, we, I should, have published, uh, should have publicized the Permaculture Research Digest. I'm always putting stuff on the Permaculture Blog. I'm always putting stuff on the Permaculture Research Digest, uh, journal articles which deal with this kind of stuff. If anyone's got some, just email them to me. I'll put them straight up on the Digest. So that research is out there. We know it's really good. It goes beyond where I want to be and where I think most permies want to be. But, yeah, find some stuff and send it to me. It'd be great. Thank you very much, Chris. Okay, thank thank you. you very much. Thank you.